Good morning. morning. How are you? Yeah? I don't know if you heard, we had an election this week, and the uh, outcomes are pretty overwhelming. And I just want to acknowledge that I've spoken with some of you, and I know that some of us are hopeful and happy with the results. Some are not. Some are fearful and grieving. And some, honestly, just don't know what all the fuss is about anyway. And so I just want to acknowledge that we are a church that is not defined by political partisanship. You are sitting next to someone or near someone who did not vote like you. That the power of politics in this partisan age is dividing communities. I would imagine some of you have family members that you are no longer in a relationship because of politics. Uh, I know some of you are not looking forward to Thanksgiving because of politics. So I want to say and hold space knowing that we all had different weeks. But this church, the, our congregational church, is not, has never been, and will not be a church that's defined by political partisanship. That we want to hold space for some who are grieving and some are happy. Yeah. Um, and that our connecting point to one another is in and through the person of Jesus Christ. So I want to begin by reading a psalm of ascent. We're going to be talking briefly about the psalms of ascent and their purpose in the life of Israel. Uh, it's got an image that's going to seem a little weird and maybe unsanitary, but the, the way that oil in, in, is a vehicle for God's blessing over his people, a way of... of Uh, symbolizing God's presence uh, is what the oil is. This is Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion for where the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Let's stand and sing to that God together. If you will join me singing together, hymn number 85, Glorious is Thy Name.
Please remain standing and join me in reading together our words of witness. We believe in God the Father, you say good morning to someone as you return to your seat? Again, today is Veterans Day weekend. And so if you are a veteran of the U.S. Armed Services, would you stand so we can acknowledge and recognize you? So we are a grateful church and a nation that's grateful for your service. Thank you. We we'll also want to let you know that Jean Neist uh, went home to be with the Lord on Tuesday. Uh, I had the uh, opportunity to spend some time with her a couple of weeks before her passing, and she was a saint. Yep. She truly, truly was overflowing with love, the proximity of God, the love of her family, her friends, and she will be dearly missed. Since the time of the ancient church, people have struggled with the problem, the problem of evil and the power of God. And I've studied it for 50 years, and I've got the answer. <laughs> and I'm so excited, I can't wait to hear what I'm gonna say next week. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> uh, just a reminder that our thanks, uh, Thanksgiving food drive ends today. We've already have so many boxes full of different canned goods and food for people in our community. But if you are on the fence or just haven't had an opportunity to purchase anything this week, I would recommend uh, two options. Uh, it's probably going to be challenging to bring something in because the office will be closed later. So if you go online and you hit the Give button, you'll see a drop-down menu that will say something related to the, the giving that you can have for Thanksgiving food drives. Or you can also put any offering in, whatever amount, it really doesn't make a difference because it's all gonna lump together so we can purchase anything that we're lacking and any more meals that we may wanna purchase. So you can put in there just a Thanksgiving offering, um, specifically the Thanksgiving food drive so we know it's for family services. Uh, so you can donate online or put any offering into the basket. Um, an additional notice, I guess, we're trying something new but a familiar tradition. Um, in years past, at the Thanksgiving and Christmas 
breaks, we've taken up an offering, a special offering, which is specifically to support nonprofit organizations in our community that are doing great work to meet the needs of our community. Uh, what we realized last year is we even forgot to do that. Um, how did that happen? Well, we realized that we take up a lot of different offerings for different things. And so we thought what would be a great idea is to combine them. So we have a new tradition called Thanksmas. And the Thanksmas offering is gonna be a two month offering. It's an opportunity uh, for you to provide any resources that you may have available in this holiday season to support. This year we're choosing Youth Hope. Uh, they're trying to purchase 200 pairs of shoes for the youth in our community, uh, which is a daunting task. They have some support in other areas, but still 200 shoes is a lot of shoes. And so we wanna take up a special offering for them between now and the Christmas season, so that way they can purchase it. Um, in the back, in case you didn't receive a letter in the mail, we have the letters in the back that Pastor John wrote, so that way you, it explains a little more detailed what we're actually doing, and then there's a special thanks miss Turkey Santa offering envelope for you as well that you can put in your offering, uh, so that way we know it's specifically for Youth Hope and supporting them in this holiday season. And as always, if you have any questions about that, feel free to let me know, or someone in our missions committee, and I'm sure we can provide the information for you. With that said, uh, youth and the kids, we have our classrooms after our special music, and then as a reminder again, we have our offering baskets in the back, donating online at Redland South Church or bringing in offerings during the week. And Monday we are closed, so it'll be Tuesday or Thursday this week. Thank you. Please feel free to sing this refrain with us. that is let by his hand.
today you hear his voice harden not your heart if today you hear his voice harden not your heart oh that today you would hear his voice harden not your heart as on that day in the desert when your parents put me to the test You know, there's songs that you've never heard before, but you feel like you've known them for a really long time. That feels like one of those songs. And as I was listening to it, I was thinking about since 1900, people have prayed and worshiped in this space. That says something. And we join through history and prayer as an offering and also as a relational connection with God. And so this morning, uh, would you pray with me with open hearts, soft hearts, and open minds? Good and faithful God. Thank you, Father, for gathering us once again. We are before you as your people, your church, whose only hope is in you, Jesus. Transparently, Lord, we find ourselves in a time and place of tension. How could there not be, as we as a nation with many perspectives and opinions decided who would lead us over the next several years? Some feel jubilation and hope, while still others are experiencing fear and anxiety. We name these things because they are true. And because they are true, we can almost sense division that scorn or that hatred, that bitterness or that anger or even a brashness with elation, whatever it may be, in these moments, Lord, I cannot think of a better place to be than here with you as your church. You are our fixed point proclaiming peace be with you. We do not know what the future will hold, but we do know that you hold us in the future just as you hold us today. For you are our savior and the one we have given our lives to. We prayerfully acknowledge that in your sovereign wisdom, you chose your living church, the body of Christ, our siblings of past, present, and future, as how transformation will come about here on earth. It is you, Jesus, who taught us to seek first your kingdom, and as we will pray later for that very kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. Through your headship and guidance, our lives are shaped and molded into your image. And in the context of the church, we are being taught to learn and discern what it means to love others as you have loved us, to take up our cross and follow you. So Lord, what does that look like for us as your church? What does loving you and our neighbor look like? How do we scatter from here with these lives shaped and molded by you, going about your ways in our everyday lives? We pray, Holy Spirit, 
that your word will become deeply rooted in our hearts as we worship and dwell in the good news, that it would provoke us toward your righteousness and goodness, that all who are thirsty and hungry would feast upon the mercy, grace, and peace that you offer, and that an unshakable conviction of your unfailing love would prune away the sins and idolatries of our hearts. In your tender mercy, renew us. Alpha and Omega are beginning and end. Help us place all our faith and hope in you. Lord, now in quietness, we bring the burdens and cares of our hearts before you. Thank you for meeting us in them. Now please join me in a minute of communal silent prayer. Now would you join me in praying the prayer Jesus himself gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven,
Good morning. We have readings from both the Old and New Testaments this morning. Our first reading is, can be found on page 665 in the Pew Bibles or up on the screen. It is 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1 through 3. David summoned all the officials of Israel to, ass to assemble at Jerusalem the officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions, the service of the king, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, together with the palace officers, the warriors, and all the brave fighting men. King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had in mind my heart to build a house as a palace of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. But God said to me, you are not to build a house to my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Next reading is Luke chapter 19, verses 37 through 46, on pages 1633 and 1634. When he came near the place where the road goes down the, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let's start with David, shall we? Okay, good, yeah, that's where we're gonna start. So uh, David is in the end of his reign. He is thinking through transition, transition of power, transition of power to his son Solomon. And there is one part of his legacy that was very important to him. If you would have asked him at the beginning of his reign as the king of Israel, what is one thing that you would want to accomplish as a king? He would have said, if I could do one thing, it would be I would build the temple for God. I would build a temple for his dwelling place among his people. He's lived in a tabernacle, a tent, it's showing wear and tear. It's been across the desert for several times. And God needs a home. He needs a permanent home. Here I am in a palace, and God is in a tent. So he begins to move forward with these plans. And Nathan, his kind of prophet in residence, calls him over and says, listen, I got some, some bad news. Nathan has given David some bad news before, Bathsheba would be one that stands to mind and the punishment for his um, indiscretion, we'll say. Uh, rape and murder, we call those indiscretions. And so this time he comes and says, because you, uh, because uh, it was prophesied that the temple would be built in a time of peace, uh, there's not peace here, uh, your son Solomon will be the one to build it. And so he gets the bad news from Nathan and doesn't sit well with him, so he goes above Nathan, kind of pulls rank on him and talks to God directly. And when he talks to God, he hears from God what you just read, that I am not the one 
to build because I am a warrior who has shed blood. So it's Solomon's task. So he's gathered his cabinet together, all the people in power, and he says, top of the agenda, number one, part of this little committee meeting here, temple. And I'm not going to be the one to do it. You can hear his heartbreak. This is my legacy. This is what I wanted for God. Um, and he says, it's not to me. And he describes the house of the temple, the house of God, as the, the, the space where, the place where the ark would dwell. And he calls the ark the footstool of God. And if I were to say to you, I felt like somebody's footstool, you would probably presume that that was a sign of feeling victimized or dominated in some way. But the footstool of a king, the footstool of a king is a place where the king would take the treaties, the agreements between other nations, the I mean, kings didn't really campaign, but the promises they made to their people uh, would, would dwell in there. So when David is talking about the ark as a footstool, he is using political language to talk about the covenants that God has made with his people. That when God rules, when he sits on his throne, and he has a footstool, the footstool is the place where his covenants dwell. So when God is reigning, He's mindful of the covenants he's made with his people. What was in the ark? Well, three things we know of. One is the Aaron's staff, staff that budded, the staff that symbolized God's power going with Aaron and Moses. Uh, the Ten Commandments were in there. And then a golden jar with some manna in it. I don't know how the manna was doing at the time. It didn't have a long shelf life that we learned from scripture. About, about eight hours was about all it was good for. But each of these symbolizing to God's people, when God reigns, he remembers his people. The footstool, the place, the ark of the what? Of the covenant. That, that's the symbol here, is the covenants that God has made with his people, and then, and then the Ten Commandments, of course, symbolize our side of the covenant, what it means to honor God. So as we go through, and just real quick, Solomon did build the temple in about the year 957 BCE. Uh, it was destroyed by the Babylonians some 370 years later. Um, flattens, not a stone on top of the other, but then the exiles return to Jerusalem, and so when Jesus is going to the temple, he's going to what archaeologists call the, sunkle, the second temple. Whenever you study the life, the, the, the religious context that Jesus did his ministry in, it's called the second temple period, because it's the time when the temple had been rebuilt, but the time before it was destroyed by the Romans in a siege, much like the Babylonians destroyed it before in the year AD 70. So as we move forward, hold these thoughts in your mind as Jesus now goes to the temple. Thought number one, God identifying with his people in exile and waiting for the temple to be built during a time of peace. Two, in the center of the Holy of Holies of the temple was the Ark of the Covenant, which David calls a footstool. Um, the Psalms of Ascent, as people sing as they go out there, refer to it as a footstool. That is a symbol of the covenant that God has made with his people, both the way he's provided for them in manna, the way he delivered them from, from occupation and slavery out of Egypt with the staff, and then the Ten Commandments, our obligations, the ways that God has asked us as his people. Sorry, I'm, he didn't ask us. He asked the Israelites. This is, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Uh, the way that he covenanted with Israel, this is how you be my people. These are the Ten Commandments that frame what it means to be faithful and obedient to me. If you forget those ways, if, if you refuse to take the obligation, part of, and this is the third point, that what 
is associated with the temple and what he told David when he said, no, you're not to build the temple. What the reason God gave is because this temple bears what? This temple bears my name, okay? Three things, one, time of peace, two, a space where God honors the covenant he's made to his people, and three, that the reminder that my name to all the nations is associated with this, with this place. Now here comes Jesus. Jesus is heading towards the temple, knowing its fate. There's two fundamental different ways that Jesus talked about the temple and the destruction of the temple. One, symbolically, metaphorically, talking about himself as the temple. And two, historically, prophesying that the temple would be destroyed by Romans and even going so far in several places in the gospel saying, some of you will see it happen. And when you do, get out of Jerusalem for the fate has come and the destruction is near. John, the gospel of John, not me, I will not be referring to myself in the third person today or any day. So the gospel writer, the gospel of John, records the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in, in the second chapter of John. And he goes in there and he overturns the tables and drives out all the animals and, and, and says, you've turned this house of prayer for the nations into a den of robbers. And somebody says, by what authority do you do this? Why do you take it upon yourself to overturn the temple that was here before you will be here after you? This temple that has been running and doing God's work for generation after generation. By what authority do you do this? This is what he says in John chapter two, verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Very simple theology here. What is Jesus talking about? Is he talking about the literal temple? No, he is talking about himself as the temple. He's talking about how, what the temple is, is both um, ultimately a place that bears the name of God, a place where God's covenants and promises are fulfilled through his reigning governance, and with the Ten Commandments, the way that Jesus perfectly honors and demonstrates to the world, this is what God intends from his people, this sort of life. So he's taking what the temple has always represented to Israel, the true intention behind it, and what he's saying to the world, to us, to his people, to anyone who hears his words and does not harden their hearts, I am the temple. And when it is destroyed, it will come back and it will never be taken or torn down again. Luke, wants you in his gospel, we're back to Luke now, and he wants you to see centrally in his gospel the importance of the temple. Where does Luke begin his gospel record? Where it begins in the temple? With the priest, Zechariah, receiving the news of Jesus' birth from an angel. You're like, John, I thought this at first was an Easter sermon, now it's turning into a Christmas sermon. Yeah. We're gonna jump around a little bit. It's just a Bible sermon. Um, begins with Zechariah receiving the news. His parents bring him to the temple and Simeon and Anna are there and they both have been promised to see the Messiah. So you can see uh, at several times at the beginning of Jesus' story in the Gospel of Luke, the temple is at the center of it. What is the only story we have from Jesus' teenage years? When his parents took him to Jerusalem they have a festival, and they go head home without them. And at one point, Mary realizes it, and she goes, Kevin! No, I'm just kidding. That was a Home Alone reference. <laughs> All you 90s kids out there. Uh, they go back there, and, and where, does, where does his parents find Jesus? In the temple, teaching. The temple here, and as we're heading towards the end of Jesus' life, of course, he's heading to the temple. It's a bookend in Luke's telling of the Jesus story. Um, and 
Here's where he prophesies the literal, actual destruction in Luke chapter 21, just two chapters ahead. Some of his disciples were marking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. So they're like, this, isn't this temple beautiful? It's overwhelmingly beautiful. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. So Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple both in his body, with good news, in three days I'll rebuild it. And he talks about the temple as bad news. Not one stone will be turned over. This beautiful temple built to God will come down and be destroyed. So Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. They are singing Psalms of Ascent. This is Psalm 132, just so you can get a picture of what a Psalm of Ascent sounded like. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Again, that's language we're familiar with now. Saying, arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. These psalms of ascent that start in Psalm 120 and go through 13, 14 psalms, I forget how many, are songs that as pilgrims were coming to Jerusalem, they would sing. So picture Jesus with his disciples, not just the 12, but a crowd of disciples, people that have been following him. They come up over the hill. What's Jesus riding? Riding, he's riding a donkey, a colt, some, uh, a beast of burden is the important part. Not The thing that's important it's not a war horse. It's a beast of burden of some kind. It's an animal that's used not to charge into battle. You would not really find that advantageous in a battle, that animal that Jesus is riding on. Um, and he comes in, Psalms of Ascent, and one of the people there quotes Psalm 118, 26, where it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But, he gets a little political. Instead of saying, blessed is the man, he says, blessed is the king. Now, they already have a king. They have King Herod. They have Pontius Pilate. They have the ultimate king of all the kings in, in Rome, which would have been Caesar himself. Calling Jesus king would have been obviously seen as a claim to power and authority. This would have been seen as seditious. This would have been seen as um, rebellion against Rome. So they get caught up. The disciples are singing, calling him king. The king has come home. The king has returned to Jerusalem. This psalm of ascent we said of the Messiah coming. This is Jesus. He is that Messiah. They're getting you know, you can see the joy, the dancing, the singing. Can you imagine singing a psalm and saying the promise in this psalm is right here and we are witnesses to it? The Pharisees are skeptical. The Pharisees are fearful. They come to Jesus, not in a way that they often do of challenging, critiquing him, but they're afraid. They say, Jesus, please, quiet your disciples. This is not the time to be shouting king. There are soldiers around that will hear that. And we all know of rebellions that have happened. We all know people that have been killed by Rome for saying things like this. For your sake and for their sake, quiet them. And Jesus says, if they're quiet, the stones are going to cry out. The rocks, the trees, that all of creation has been longing, as Paul says, crying out for redemption, save us, rescue us. There's something happening, and somebody's going to take note of it. Somebody's going to sing. Somebody's going to say it and name it. And if it's not them, it's going to be the stones, because they understand what is happening. So the song continues, the march continues, the dancing continues, they finally come up over the hill and they see laid out before them Jerusalem. There it is. 
in all its beauty, all that it means to God's people. Even with Rome, at least they get Jerusalem. They see the temple, the beautiful towering in the center of the city, the temple that Solomon built, that the Babylonians destroyed, that the exiles rebuilt in all its beauty, the the sun shining off the stone. And Jesus, in that moment, with all that dancing, all that beauty, weeps. He falls and he weeps and says, if you, O Israel, if you, Jerusalem, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This moment of triumph, of joy, of the king's return, everything building to this moment of Jesus entering as king, and he weeps. They did not see what was in front of them. Why? What'd they miss? Well, why is he riding a colt? Let's read Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. That's what's happening right now. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. And the battle bow will be broken, who will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and the river to the ends of the earth. How many of you long for that peace? It's this image of all the instruments of war gone. Why? We don't need them anymore. It's peace. Peace has come. The king has come. Of war forever gone, a peace that can never be taken away, a king on a throne sitting with his feet on the footstool of the covenants and promises he made to his people, bringing to them finally a real lasting peace. A king on a colt, on a donkey. And you have to imagine, this is what I imagine, it's like comical. He, it's so small, his feet are dragging. And I've ridden on a horse that was too small for me. This is not a majestic creature or a majestic moment in my life. And it's intended to be seen in some ways as a visible sign. Look and see. When you see God acting, do not close your eyes. It's a little variant on your song today. That's the other side of it. Don't, don't, don't close your eyes when you see God acting. And coming in there, not on a war horse, pointing at an enemy, leading people into battle, but coming to suffer, coming to confront our real enemy, death itself. Jesus coming to king, seeing the city, but also seeing it burning, hearing the cries of a mother that has just seen their child fall in battle. And as he beholds the sight, knowing what was coming, cries out in a loud voice, if you had just known what would bring you peace. But God spoke and your heart hardened. And now a dark day was coming. And then he goes to the temple. Not as people would expect him to go, but to cleanse it, to purify it, to drive out those who were using this space to profit uh, in some way from it. And he calls them and accuses them of turning God's house into a house of robbers. He's quoting Jeremiah 7:11, which says, has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. You know, God watching, it's good news for some and bad news for others. For those who long for justice, 
for goodness, for righteousness. It's very good news to know God's watching, God sees, and God will have the final word. But to those in that temple, not good news. Those who were profiting off of a system that they inherited without going back and saying, Are we, should we be doing things this way? The way that Jesus described it, quoting Jeremiah here, is he calls it a robber's den. And it's easy to miss that a robber's den is not a place where robbers rob, right? There is no stealing in a, rob- in a robber's den. Um, A robber's den is a place where robbers go where they think they're safe. And what Jesus is saying, quoting the prophet Jeremiah, speaking of the temple, is you think you're safe here because you're at the temple. You think you're safe here because what you do, you do in my name. But I've been watching. I've been been looking at what's happening into the place that bears my name. And I've come to pronounce judgment, that it's days are numbered. They were blinded by power, comfort, and now Jesus had come. Jesus was standing before them, and the bill was due. I've chosen some comforting texts today, haven't I? I do want to end with a note of comfort, and it's a reminder to take us back. What was the temple for? What did God intend this space to be. Jesus tells us what it is, but he's quoting from Isaiah. So let me let Isaiah have the last word here. As he stands at the temple, he's quoting these words from Isaiah. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles in Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Do you hear the hope in those verses? this place where all the nations will gather, this place where all the nations will be welcomed into the presence of God, a place that draws all people across all space and time, countries, different cultures, languages, all the people in the world who seek God, finding him here in this place. And what is the temple that got rebuilt? It's Jesus who is lifted up and draws all to himself. Jesus wept before the temple, judged it as having departed from the way of peace, the way of welcoming the world, the way of extending God's blessing outward into the world and saying the temple now is me, my resurrected body, that I might draw all people for all who long for good news i have some good news today jesus is the place where god dwells jesus is the one who reigns on a throne mindful of his covenants and jesus is the one who invites us to join him in drawing all people to real peace Would you pray with me? Father, in this season as we consider Jesus' judgment of the temple while rebuilding a new one in and through his body, we thank you for the good news that your son came to us to bring us true peace. That while many missed it at the time, we ask that we would have the eyes of faith, the ears to hear, that we would hear you speak, that we would not harden our hearts but that we would know you are true peace. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you join me in standing and singing together hymn number 497, Near the Heart of God.
Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, I'm going to close now with a benediction from one of the other Psalms of Ascent, Psalm number 124. And know anyone who's experiencing any anxiety, fear in this season, Jesus will always get the last word. Here now, your benediction from Psalm 124. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen.